the first thing I want to say, and it's really important for me to say this, is I am happy to see a lot of younger people in this room. <laughs> Somebody like that. <laughs> That's the youth alarm. <laughs> Every time. Sorry. <laughs> Try it again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, part of the reason for that is because when I was your age, I'm 70 now, and when I was your age, I was sitting at meetings like this, and one of the things that I have seen is that a lot of young people, or younger people, let's say, they're not sitting at meetings anymore. I don't quite know what they're doing, but they're not coming out and they're not interested in, or more, perhaps more exactly, because my own children say this, they just feel like sometimes, what's the point? It's not gonna change, it's not gonna be different. And I'm saying to you, if we don't work at it, well, it is going to be different. The question is, well, will we like the difference? So, Having heard tonight, oh, just about everything I was going to say, I'll just run through it quickly and get to the part where I can talk about what I want to talk about. Okay, why have rent control? Because it supports aging in place. Remember, I didn't know all you people were coming or all of them were speaking. So this was while I was in my own little corner. And because it builds neighborhoods and keeps them stable. And there's some highfalutin guy from the UK who's now going to be working in housing for the city of Vancouver. I've forgotten his name. And I did read the article in The Sun about him, but I will tell you that the pretty much the last four lines of the last column of the article, which was a half page spread with his picture in it, mentioned homeless people, people on welfare, seniors, and people with disabilities. Now, if those four groups are at the bottom, and didn't even mention Aboriginal people. So, if those are the groups who are still at the bottom of your article. They're really at the bottom. My home, if you like, um, is for a lot of you in this room, the far north. I'm from Whitehorse. I raised the kids there. And like almost all kids, as soon as they we're old enough to go to university. They said, we're getting out of what, out of the Yukon. It's the armpit of the world. We're leaving, we're going to where it's nice. That's Vancouver. <laughs> now, notice they didn't say Toronto, Halifax. <laughs> so, you know, the closest big place. And they did. There was a few years where they were trading the same apartment between them. And in the early 90s, I followed them. I got a job here, and I came to Vancouver. Now, what was lucky for me, as far as I'm concerned, especially now that I'm a senior, and especially as we're talking about Grandview Woodland, is there were People in Whitehorse, it's kind of an elevator that goes from, you know, communities in Whitehorse down to Vancouver and back up to the Yukon and then back down to Vancouver and then up to the Yukon and then maybe overseas somewhere and then, you know. And people had told me about this place called The Drive. I said, hmm, the what? <laughs> the Drive, The Drive, it's like Main Street, only it's The Drive. Okay, okay, because Main Street literally is Main Street in Vancouver, in, uh, in Whitehorse, and that's where everything is. And they said, there's the drive, there are co-ops, 
There's the co-op store. I said, a co-op store, just like in Manitoba? They said, well, it's a co-op. I said, oh, okay. Uh, they said, they're circling dawn. I said, who? They said, circling dawn. I said, okay, well, whatever. Sweet cherubim. I said, that a bakery? They said, well, no, not really. They sell everything. And Normans. All right. They said, never mind, you'll like it. There's a park. You'll get to know people. There are stores that you can actually go into and speak to people about. And they're there. It's the same store. It's not just an extra work, which is yellow, and you go there and get your groceries and buy them and do extra work to pack them up and take them home. They said, you'll like that. And I have to tell you, frankly, if I hadn't landed on the drive, I wouldn't have stayed in Vancouver. Because in this community, I found something that resembled what I had in White Horse. People I would see on the street that I knew from some place or other, a meeting or something, a park where I could sit and uh, people spoke to each other, uh, stores where I could go in. It's a lot different now. For some of you may, may or may not remember when there were more real stores on the drive, not just restaurants and cafes. But if I hadn't had that support, I wouldn't have stayed in Vancouver because it's a lot different living in a small town where you know people and where you're the, the kids say, we don't like going down Maine with you. Mom, you have to stop and talk to everybody. <laughs> so there you go. So that's why I stayed here, and I've been here for 20 years now. I got a job that I liked. I had a partner that I liked. I got a house that I liked, a car that I liked, and a great neighborhood. And by Y2K, that had all changed. In Y2K, I moved into a DERA building because the funding for the agency I ran dried up. The Fed said, we're not putting money into that anymore. And like a lot of NGOs or nonprofits or whatever, experimental agencies, gone. Partner went back to school, gone. Car house gone, I'm older, and my health is also going. So I moved into a deer building with another woman who needed a roommate to meet her rent, and the first thing I discovered was, maybe all of you know this, but queen-size beds do not fit into bedrooms in social housing. They don't. You can get it in, but you will not be able to do much more than sit on your bed and get out of it. And that was a big surprise. I'd never lived in a house where the bedroom was so small that a queen size bed, and never mind anything else you might, like a chair, desk, none of that stuff. It was a new reality to go along with the new life. I also discovered from sitting on the board at that Deer building that buildings that had been made from expo materials were beginning to fall apart, like seriously fall apart. And uh, tenants were having to fight, and I mean fight, I mean go down there and pound on desks to have crisis repairs done. So people are telling you the water is running out from <coughs> unit so and so to unit such and such because the pipes that they used to put them in didn't, haven't stood up. 
after Expo, and nobody wants to hear it. Your problem, your building, get your board to do something. These are boards that do not have the income to just call a plumber and say, fix this. I decided that the downtown east side and a Adira building that needed us to fight with each other as well as fight with the outside was not the place for me and besides my health didn't like it. So I put in applications for a accessible apartment and within two years I got one. I was thrilled, went to see it, it was a great apartment, Looked okay to me. First issue, when can we move in? Well, the people who are moving out will be moving out the same day that you are moving in. I said, how's this supposed to work? <laughs> Yo, you guys work it out. It's your problem. And that should have given me a heads up about the, their issues in this building. Okay. Next, caveats. You all know this one. If you live in any kind of housing, there will be no subsidies. There are no subsidies now, and there are no subsidies in the foreseeable future. So the whole rent is your responsibility. Caveat number two, the room, which is about as big as being slightly facetious, four of these chairs, that was built so that a person with disabilities could have a attendant, will be counted as a second bedroom and costed as such. So that's how I moved into the building that I've been in now for 14 years. I'm not even going, some people know the history of that building. It has an excellent history. But if you don't, continue to have support from governments, all of them, city, provincial, federal. People who moved in originally to those housing developments were never, ever meant to cough up what it takes to maintain one of those buildings. Can I remember the name of the building? Entre Newfound. Yeah. And co-ops are in exactly the same position, or at least they were 20 years ago. They just didn't have the money to do the upkeep. All right, now I have to get like Ryder. What else does it say here? Uh, I was going to tell you guys why you need to <clears throat> make sure, even though you think there will be no money for your old age security or GIS, tough bananas start saving. Because otherwise, you're going to end up 60 and 70 years old living on a fixed income in which 80% of my income goes to housing. And that, because this is a friendly crowd, let me tell you, why did that happen? Aside from my own stupidity, that is, never thinking I'd get to 70. <laughs> I didn't think I would die, but I also didn't think I would get to 70. So, this does happen. But NGOs, community organizations, they don't receive the money anymore that allows them to tell their workers that they can afford to build a pension plan. So it's all up to you guys. And when, and it, unless you think you, it has to be a million dollars, I don't care what the Globe and Mail says, it doesn't. <laughs> because when you're living on a fixed income, OAS and GIS, 
an extra hundred dollars a month is a lot of money. And that some of you can manage to do between now and the time you're 70. All right. The good news is I live in a building with a broad mix of families, LGBT, elders, First Nations, immigrants. We've got about 20 kids in the building now between birth and um, 20, I think. So that's pretty nice. Bad news or not so good news, the building is over 20 years old. Repairs are expensive, so they don't get done. For some reason, the tenants, the management, and the board all seem to be talking at cross purposes. And the building's falling apart. Even my children, who went to see someone we knew who started that building when it was new, when they first came and found out we were in that building, they were quite pleased when they, the girls came and saw the building and said, Mom, it looks like a slum. It didn't look like this before. So, costs keep going up. I'm finally going to apply for SAFER because the next rent increase takes my rent past 80%. Over the years, I have seen tenants do a lot of things to live. And we're talking about that building. I have seen a family with seven members, one of them older than I am, living in a space, the largest apartments we have are, I think there is one four-bedroom apartment, two, perhaps two, but seven people of which they're all, except for two, grown up, living in a space that wasn't adequate for them. Single tenants have shared with others who they don't particularly like and end up fighting with, and both of them end up getting uh, evicted. Teens live in a space that's adequate for a toddler. I know because my sister-in-law is in early childhood development and I asked her to look at the rooms and say, what size of kid do you think should live here? She said a toddler. And perhaps most harmful for the building, as a community, some families are just waiting for a better situation. They don't care about the building, don't care about the apartment, don't care about the grounds, and don't care about the rest of us, because they just are waiting until they've saved enough money or they get asked to move into a better situation. Elders move out because there are no subsidies. Even elders who lived in the building from the very beginning. At this point, ENF cannot find a way to keep those few in the building where they've lived for 20 years and raised their children. Further, some families and seniors are one month from being homeless. And Maureen has talked about rent evictions. So we have a housing society that often would like to get us old renters out because they can raise the rent at this point. Market is a lot more than I'm paying. The landlord and tenant board, it seems to me as a person who's worked in, with communities and community development, there's something wrong there. I don't know what it is, but there is something wrong. Because I have seen people hounded in my building. And that board doesn't do much for them. 
We have our share of couch surfers, people with children who don't have a place to live, not really. They come in and stay for a while, and then they go out for a while, and then they come back and stay for a while. What would rent control do from my point of view? Well, rent control would make it possible for seniors and elders to age in place. Something we talk a lot about, don't seem to be doing much about. That seniors would have security of tenure. Every one of us in my building who's over 70 is scared shitless that management will look at the big book on the internet because if they do, they will find something in there that we have done and they will kick our punk asses out. And we know that. So we don't like to fight, we don't like to put our heads up, we don't like to get into things, nothing. We just wanna be quiet, because we need a place to live. Rent control could make sure the tenants are not hounded out of building by toxic management. They could reduce them using rental increases as a club over people's head. They can ensure that a policy has embedded within it legislation that's pro-tenant, pro-rights for tenants, pro-rights and responsibility for landlords and tenants. They could stabilize neighborhoods regardless of income by stabilizing buildings. They could make it possible the neighborhoods and buildings continue to have various types of renters. And they could stabilize life for seniors because for some of us, I have no idea whether by 80 I'll have Alzheimer's and I won't live in that building. But until I reach that time, I would like to know that if I want to continue living in that building, I can. If I got kicked out tomorrow, would I go back to Whitehorse? Probably, because at least in Whitehorse, all of my medical is paid, which it definitely is not here because I just got a letter from MSP telling me them that I owe them more money than I pay in rent. And if not Whitehorse, then where? On the street? In a heated shelter? Sound like a great life for a senior? It's not a great life for anybody, but definitely not for a senior. More shelters? I don't know. But when Maureen asked me if I would speak tonight, I'm speaking because I'm only the beginning of the wave of seniors. So there's, we better start looking for an answer. We haven't done very well. We have not done well for First Nations people. We have not done well for people with mental health issues. We have not done well for addicts. We have not really done well for women. And if what we're doing is any example, we're not fucking going to do well for seniors either. 